begin to think about these joints in the body and we've got all these different types where we've got hyaline, we've got fibro, um, the types of movements, you know, how movable the joint can be. Well, as we begin to look at these classes that we've been looking at, we're going to say that we can put these joints into their, based on what their bones look like, okay, how they begin to articulate, and we're going to say, well, this is a saddle joint, or this is a pivot joint, or this is a ball and socket joint, okay, that's how you might hear some of them being referred to. So we can have what they term as a plain joint, and it's, it's not like plain, like P-L-A-I-N, but P-L-A-N-E, like you're working in a plane of movement. A saddle joint, we say that because it looks just like, you know, the bones, like you're sitting in a saddle. A hinge joint, because it looks like something's working on a hinge. Pivot, something pivots around one of the bones, okay? Ball and socket joints, or ellipsoid. And I think this is like in your textbook, your lab manual, everything. And some examples. Like for a plane joint, it's almost like the two bones are flat and they're just simply, you know, having that articulation with a nice piece of cartilage between them. Good example, the intervertebral discs. The ones that are a saddle joint, the carpometacarpal. Huh? Carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. So when you look at what the connection is between what we think of as the wrist bone and the hand bones, all right, the connections look like this saddle connection with those bones. A hinge joint, cubital, um, if we're looking at like the knee, for example, it's only moving in that one direction, okay? So we're going to say that that is a hinge joint. This is a hinge joint, okay? Because we're only getting that one movement that's occurring. Pivot. Have you noticed the structure between the radius and the ulna? Why is it called, why do you think it's called the radius? It's got the head that looks like it's in a circle. Does that make sense? And then the ulna, have you ever looked at the U and the ulna? Yep. And it's really cool, but you have those articulating in the forearm and they can make it do this because of the structure that's present. Ball and socket, hip, shoulder, okay, giving us the socket that has the most freedom. It is the most freely movable joint of the body, the ball and socket. The ellipsoid, what we find, like between the skull and C1, because the structure there looks like an ellipsis. So that's why they just term it an ellipsoid. And then, because of the way C1 and C2 articulate, we're getting this ability to be able to do this. Now, granted, some ligaments and stuff are helping too. So the plane or gliding, think about the, I just went through it. I, didn't think to flip through the slides, okay? But the plane or the gliding, giving you some examples there. The saddle joints, giving some more examples. Hinges, elbow, ankle, interphalangeal, all right? Pivot joints, like I was, you know, think about um, what we're going to get. Radius and ulnar, 
That's probably the best one. Okay, the best example. Ball and socket, shoulder, hip. All right, those are the two. Ellipsoid, that one existing between um, the vertebra and the skull. Now, when we have the joints, the joints are giving us what we term types of movement. What type of movement am I getting? from that particular joint area. Gliding, little bit of movement. Think about the wave, okay, that happens with the wrist bone. You can actually feel it there. That's why I kind of like that example. You can actually kind of feel just that little bit of movement waving. It's like one of the areas you can do it. Angular. Now, with angular, we're doing flexion and extension, okay? Flexion and extension. These, however, because we're giving up stability, a little bit of stability for movement, that means things can go wrong. And one of the things that can go wrong is when you hyper extend those joints, okay? Think about this one and maybe uh, hyper extending that joint. Have you seen that happen? So did me and the wrestling match. Which joint? Which oh, area? My, knee. Like my knee? whole body went forward, but my leg stayed straight. And I hit, I hit the ground before my leg did, or before my leg even came up. Did it tear anything? Yeah, it tore it. I hyperextended my knee, tore hamstring fibers. Damage my meniscus and sprain my ankle. Good job. <laughs> now, what did they do for all that? Uh, I didn't. It wasn't damaged enough to um, have surgery, so okay. I just kept it in like a cast. But, like, what about the meniscus? I didn't. It wasn't enough to have surgery. It was just. It it's was never created any yeah, more problems yeah. or anything. I mean, it kind of. I don't have like. It kind of hurts every now and then, but it's nothing too bad. But I had to keep it straight and walk on crutches for a while. Because mm -hmm. the meniscus will never heal. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like, it wasn't but enough. The, but they have developed material now that they're putting in, that they're, you know, like, like studying on replacing. Yeah, and yeah it's them. not, it wasn't enough that it would do anything super bad. Like it just hurts and pops every now and then, but it's not that horrible. Hmm. It's doing more than you think. But until you get to the point where it completely locks up, you ain't got to worry about it. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, my stepdad doesn't like even have a knee, really. He can't even, he like has to like wobble and like can't even move his knee. He had a knee replacement? Um, I think he's had several. And he's mm -hmm. like 45. He had a tractor fall on him when he was 13. Yeah, my sister's husband was in a really bad car accident at like the age of 13 or something. He had to have his hip replaced and he had to have it two more times because, you know, you grow and... Yeah, I think he said, said like three or something. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Some th another type of movement that's special and it comes in with our feet, okay, is plantar and dorsiflexion, okay, that ability to tip it down and bring it back up. Okay, so that's really special for us. That's a special type of movement. Now, what does it mean to abduct and adduct? Abduct is when you take it away from the body. We take it away. And adduct, is and adduct I add it back to the body. So this would be my abduction. This would be my adduction, adding it back. Okay, to the body. That's how I kind of try to keep it together. Some other movements that we get, rotation or, okay, we get that kind of movement. The pronation, supination that we have, circumduction, I should have done that one. At that point, you know, like throwing a baseball, football, that sort of thing. Some other types of movement, well, looking at those types of movement, Flexion, extension, flexion, extension. Basically, away from the body, back to the body. Okay? 
flex extend, flex extend. These are terms that you're going to want to be familiar with. Okay, um, as you go through, especially those of you who are going to like go into physical therapy and so forth, these are going to become second nature for you. Okay, you're going to just hear them so many times, measure them, work with them so much that it's going to become second nature. This is the movement that's special to our feet. Okay, we don't have it anywhere else. All right, so plantar flexion, dorsal flexion. Okay, um, the abduct, adduct, like we were saying before, to ab means you take it away, add, you bring it back. That's sort of how I remember it. Circular movements, different areas of the body can have circular movements. Our pronation, supination, all right, which is very special to the forearm of the body. The circumduction, like showing, think about somebody throwing a baseball. Um, other movements that we're going to have, which we'll start after break, okay? But right now, take a break, be back at 1230. Think about everything your body's got to do for y'all to get up and move. <laughs>